hurry, hurry, come, let's go. Time's no longer on no side. Get on board quickly, this ship is going far. Get your loved ones, get your friends, find your place and settle in. We're not staying here, this ship is going far. It's going far, it's going far. To the land beyond the sky, it's going far. Now, our memory text for this week comes from Isaiah 25 and 9. And it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him, and we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This week, we're looking at this idea of, well, hope. Now, hope can mean two things. It can mean, one, wishful thinking, as in, I'm hoping that something good will happen, but I'm not sure it will. Versus, I have absolute confidence, as in I have absolute confidence that everything is going to turn out for the best. Which of those two definitions do you think we find in the Bible, especially when it comes to the second coming of Jesus? You see, this idea of hope, as we find it in the Bible, has nothing to do with wishful thinking, but rather, it's a strong confidence that something good is going to happen. Okay. So why is hope so important to us as Christians? Well, studies show that patients who have hope tend to heal and recover faster. They tend to make healthier choices and they tend to have a more positive outlook on their situation. Not only that, but patients who are hopeful tend to release more pain blocking hormones. In other words, having a positive expectation resulted in positive behaviors. So here we are, and we Seventh-day Adventists claim to have this hope that centers around the second coming of Jesus. The question we have to ask ourselves is this, how confident can we be that Christ will return? And more importantly, how should this belief affect our behavior? Now, we come to Sunday's lesson and enter the Protestant reformers who had this absolute confidence that Christ would return. Think about this. Out of the 260 chapters in the New Testament, there are over 300 references to the second coming of Christ. That's one in every 25 verses that talk about the second coming. Based on this, can we have confidence that Christ will return? Well, we know that he promised to come the first time, and he did. He promised to return from the grave, well, and he did. So, if he promised to return a second time, then don't you think that the God who does not change, the God who cannot lie, and the God who never breaks a promise? If that God tells you he's coming back again, do you have the confidence that he will? And if so, how do we show it? Well, more about that later in the week. I have a user manual that comes with my car, and it tells me all of the things I need to do to make sure that my car operates at maximum efficiency. So it says that my car operates on unleaded gasoline. Now I want you to imagine that I misread the instructions and instead of using gasoline, what I use instead is diesel. Or what if I decided to use water instead of gasoline? Is there anything that might go wrong with my car if I did that? You get my point. Making sure that you understand something before you act is critically important. The same is true regarding the second coming of Jesus Christ. We have very clear instructions regarding the nature and the manner of Christ's return. We know, for example, that no one will know the date or the time of Christ's return. But what happens if somebody missed that instruction like William Miller did? What could go wrong if you start setting dates for Christ's return like October 22, 1844? Well, you might quit your job, sell everything you own, or fail to plant your crops or your garden. Then what? Well, winter comes, and you have nothing. And that's what happened back in 1844. Or how about you believe that Christ might come in, oh, let's say, 2027? Well, you might think you have some time to get your act together, put off giving your life to Jesus. And without planning on it, you end up dying before he comes, and now you're lost. Or 2027 comes along and you quit your job, sell your house, give away everything you own, only to find out Jesus still hasn't come yet, and now you have nothing. You see what I mean about what can go wrong when you set dates? 
Or what happens if you believe that Jesus is going to come a second time, but this time it's going to be a secret? And as such, the true Christians will be snatched away while others will be left behind. That those who are left behind get a second chance at salvation, so to speak, and that Jesus will return seven years later well, to pick up the rest. Or what happens if you believe that when Jesus returns, everybody gets saved? That Jesus will usher in a new world order of peace and prosperity for the next 1,000 years? What can go wrong indeed? Here's what can go wrong. You get deceived into thinking that you are safe and saved when in fact you are open to even greater deception and that's what Satan's counting on. He's counting on people thinking that they have time, that they get a second chance or that everybody gets saved. Something the Bible doesn't teach. What it teaches is that when Jesus comes a second time, uh, there's no second chances and that the world as we know it, it's coming to an end. And when it does, you are either ready for it or you're not. Well, so how do we get ready? Read the Bible because everything you need to be ready is right there in God's book. Have you ever looked at your calendar and realized that you had a very important appointment that you were, thought was supposed to happen next week, but instead it was happening today? Now, I don't know about you, but I've had that happen to me more times than I can count. For example, I thought my wife's birthday was next week, but it's tomorrow. So what do I do? I rush out the door and do everything I can to get ready to celebrate her birthday. I imagine, well, it was a little bit like that for William Miller. One day, he's sitting down and he's deep in a Bible study. First, he has to figure out the prophetic symbols. He learned that a woman represented a church or a religious system. He learns that medals, horns, crowns, and beasts represented, well, political powers. Or they could represent a combination of religious and political powers. He learns that there is a final war, one last battle between good and evil. He discovers that war would end with the second coming of Jesus and the salvation of God's end-time people. It was with all of this in mind that Miller put his mind to the study of Daniel 8 a study that will change his life and the course of human history. So there's William Miller sitting at his desk and he's looking at Daniel chapter eight and he's trying to figure out what the 2300 day prophecy is all about. Then he takes a look at Daniel chapter nine and it clicks. A king is going to make a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. And when he gives that order, a time prophecy is going to start. He does the math. 70 prophetic weeks equals 490 prophetic days. Now, using the prophetic day for a literal year principle, and you have 490 literal years. And somewhere in those 490 years, at the 487 year mark, Christ would die for us on the cross. So, starting with 457 BC and moving forward 487 years, he arrives on a Friday afternoon in AD 33. And that day, Christ would die for our sin. The math was good. But wait, after reading Daniel 9, Miller learned that the same decree would set in motion not just one, but two time prophecies. The second time prophecy was tied to Daniel's 2300 day prophecy. Again, he did the math. 2300 prophetic days would equal 2300 literal years. So starting at 457 BC and counting forward, he arrives at October 22, 1844. He doubles and triple checks his math. The math is solid. He looks up from his desk and he asks himself, what does all of this mean? William Miller did the math and he concluded that the 2300 day prophecy of Daniel 814 would bring us to October 22, 1844. That's when the sanctuary would be cleansed. Can you imagine the look on Miller's face when he concluded that Jesus would come on October 22, 1844? Now, you might be wondering, how in the world did he interpret all of this to mean that Jesus would come on that date? I mean, after all, the Bible is clear. No one knows the day nor the hour when Jesus would return. Well, I guess Miller missed that part. 
So how did he come to that conclusion? Well, he came to that conclusion because back in the early 1800s, the common belief was that the sanctuary of Daniel chapter 8 was the earth. They hadn't received the truth yet that Jesus was in heaven and that he was currently ministering in the heavenly sanctuary. Now, you and I know that the cleansing of the sanctuary referred to a new phase of Christ's ministry. In this new ministry, Christ would go over the books in heaven to see whose names well, were written in the Lamb's book of life. This is the pre-advent judgment, and it was a work that had to take place before Jesus would come. You and I know this, but William Miller hadn't received that truth yet. So based on the information that they had at the time, Miller concluded that Jesus was going to come very soon to cleanse the earth. He looks up at his calendar and he did the math. Only this time his math led him to conclude that the world as they knew it would end in about 25 years. If you believed with an absolute certainty that Jesus was going to come in 25 years, how do you think that would impact your life? What would you do with that information? At first, Miller didn't know what else to do but pray. And as he prayed, he heard a voice that said, go tell it to the world. That idea scared him, but he knew he had to tell somebody. So here's what he said. Lord, if you want me to share this message, then you send the invitations to speak and I will share what I learned. No sooner was he done praying, but the invitations to speak started to pour in. William Miller had a mission. Go tell it to the world and tell it to the world is exactly what he did. You might recognize the name Artaxerxes. Well, first you might know his name from the history books as he just happened to be the king of the Persian Empire during the time, well, when Persia ruled the world. Well, you also might happen to know him as the husband of Queen Esther. Yes, he's that Artaxerxes. Now, after the incident with Haman's threat on the life of Queen Esther and her people had settled down, well, a group of Jews approached Xerxes and they asked him if they could go home and rebuild their nation. Well, it was 457 BC, and I can imagine that out of his love for Esther and his appreciation to Mordecai for saving his life, that Xerxes was in the mood, well, to grant such a request. What he didn't know at the time is that his decree for the Jews to go home and rebuild Jerusalem would set in motion two prophetic timelines. Now, the first timeline is the shorter of the two. It was the 70-week prophecy of Daniel 9. Now, by now, we know that this prophecy worked out to be 490 literal years. But this prophecy has several parts to it. The first part is the seven weeks. That works out to be literally 49 years, and that's how long it took the Jews to rebuild Jerusalem. Then you had another 62 weeks before something significant would happen again. Again, we do a little math, and we see that seven weeks plus 62 weeks and now 483 years have passed. Now, we do some more math, and starting at 457 BC, we add 483 years, and this brings us to AD 27. This would be the year that Jesus would be baptized and start his ministry here on earth. Then there's that last week, and somewhere in the middle of that last week, AD 31, Messiah would be cut off, meaning, that Jesus would die on the cross to save you and me. The first timeline, the 70-week prophecy, takes us to the cross. And the reason this is so important is because it is because of the cross that Christ provides our salvation. Then we have the second prophecy, and it is only one part, and it is the longest prophetic timeline in the Bible, the 2300-day prophecy. Now, using the day for a year principle, we know that 2,300 prophetic days are equal to 2,300 literal years. Again, starting in 457 BC, we add 2,300 years and we come to, you guessed it, 1844, the year the pre-advent judgment would begin. Now, think about this. Why would both the 70-week and 2,300-day prophecies share the same starting date? What is it that connects them? What connects them is God's determination to save us. You see, the first timeline takes us to the cross, which provides our salvation. The second timeline 
takes us to the pre-Advent judgment, which proves that indeed we've been saved. Again, two timelines connected by the plan of salvation. And both timelines are proof of God's determination to save us.